All right, so now let's actually dive into the actual vertebrates. In the previous video, we talked about how we had what we call chordates, which means that, yes, most of them do have a backbone, but there's a couple different phyla that do not have a true backbone. And so now we're going to actually get into those that actually have a bony structure around their notochord, also known as their spinal cord. So we start off with the basics of fish and the evolution of jaws. So the earliest fish did not have jaws. And what uh, they started to realize, not actually, but as evolution started to realize, is that it was good to have jaws that specialized mouth structure, just like what we see in some of our arthropods or some of our insects. It just made fish eat better and uh, allow them to be better predators. So our jawless fish are those that we saw, for example, the lamp lamprey in uh, in our earlier slideshow. I'm sure, if you guys could see that. There we go. Um, in our earlier slideshow, so the lack of jaws. But then, as we started to get jawfish, these are now our most diverse group, and there are two classes of classifications of these, or classes of them. You have the cartilaginous fish, and you have the bony fish. Not the easiest to say. The cartilaginous fish are called the chondriatides, and the bony fish are called the osteatides. So if you heard of osteoporosis, that deals with bone. Uh, the con, C-H-O-N, that deals with cartilage. So let's just dive right into it. So some of our cartilaginous fish, they are uh, mostly going to be oceanic, and they include things like sea rays or stingrays, sharks, and then also chimeras, which are also called ratfishes, and they look a lot like sharks. So um, they have a skeleton that is made out of cartilage rather than bone. They're still considered to be vertebrates, although it's not made of bone, but they still have protection around their dorsal nerve cord. And so there, of course, we have a fish. Uh, I'm sorry, a shark, not just a fish, but a shark. Uh, here we have a, a ray. Here we have that, uh, that fish that I mentioned earlier. What the heck is that called? A ratfish. So not the best looking creature, but a ratfish. Um, and so those cartilaginous fish eventually were thought to give rise to what we now have 96% of on Earth, and those are the bony fish. And so the class osteichthys, that means bony fish, they have um, other groups called the ray fin fish, the lobed fin fish, and lunged fish. So um, it just kind of goes with how their fins are arranged, hence the, the different divisions there. And so when we talk about, you know, phylum, then it goes class. So this is a division of the phylum um, of the fish. So let's get into those. Here we have an example of a fish. Some commonalities that we see with fish is that they all have fins. Not all of them have gills, but the majority of them do. They also will have um, you know, bilateral symmetry. They have some organs that allow them to swim. So like a swim bladder. We have a complete digestive tract with, uh, with these fish. Some of them, most of them, will go through what's called external fertilization. So a female will come, deposit her eggs. Male comes and will spawn. That means that will release his sperm on those eggs. And then for the most part, there's little to no protection with, uh, with fish. They are what we call our strategists, where they're just going to lay their eggs and then kind of leave them for, for dead, and uh, hopefully they, they survive. So here's a body plan of the fish that I mentioned. So we have the complete digestive system, we have a mouth, we have a brain, um, muscle that allows them to move, and then they are named based on what kind of fin structure they have. So um, those of you that have fished before, sometimes they'll have a variety of different kinds of, of, of fins that will allow them to move really, really well. There is a category of what we call lung fish, and it is what it sounds like. So some of them actually do have lungs also and um, gills. But the, the true lung fish means that they have lung capability. And so some will actually come up to the surface, take a big gulp of air, and then are able to withstand, you know, hours underneath water. Some are minutes, but uh, they're kind of unique in, in that regard. And so a lot of those lung fish are what are thought to give rise to the amphibians and what might have been, you know, amphibians are able to, uh, to move with, um, with their legs more so than with the fins. So here's an example of an ancient predecessor of the fish that might have given rise to the amphibians and also given rise to the lungs that, uh, that they have. And so we can look at these in the fossil record and see that there's quite a few of them that, that uh, perhaps gave rise to the amphibians. Speaking of that, so we look at this picture and this picture, 
they might have given rise to this, a fish-looking amphibian. So perhaps there got to be bone structures within those fins that they didn't necessarily use them for swimming, but maybe they used them for swimming and being on land a little bit. They would have probably had to develop um, lungs at this point to survive outside of water. And amphibians are unique. They oftentimes get mixed up with the reptiles. So characteristics of amphibians. They breathe through their skin. They have skin, not scales. They do have lungs. They have soft shelled eggs. I shouldn't really say shell, but they have soft eggs just like the fish. And they go through a process called metamorphosis. Meta, big, morph, change. So they go through big changes. And we see that probably most evidently in frogs. So when we look at early amphibians, they were probably fish-like and they were salamander-ish looking or newt looking. Um, they, they had four limbs with digits or maybe fins. They had a short neck and that's kind of what we see with our, our modern day amphibians. And they probably had a fish-like skull. So those of you that have uh, fish for musky or northern, it's kind of that flat head looking thing and the development of maybe some, some lungs and or fins or a combination of, of both. Again, it's kind of the in-betweener stage at this point. So what makes an amphibian amphibian continued? They require water at some stage of their life cycle. Many of them lay eggs in water or like underneath leaves so that they don't dry out. Their lungs are not very good. They do the job, but they're not real efficient. One of the things that you should note is that if and when you ever handle a frog or a, a salamander, a newt, a toad, try not to do it with your dry hands. We have um, oils on our skin where if we touch those things, it actually blocks those pores and so they can't breathe. So we can actually suffocate a frog or a toad just by touching them. So number one, maybe just don't touch them. Or number two, moisten or wet your hands before you grab them so that you don't affect their respiratory system. So it's kind of unique. So big trend with amphibians, and there's a lot of evidence of this in the fossil record, is that you go from gills to lungs and you go from fins to limbs. That step or those steps didn't happen overnight. It probably took a really, really long time in order to make that take place. And so we look at some of the morphology and the anatomy in some of those fossils to help prove that this evolution did happen. And as we talked about with almost every single creature that we've mentioned is that they go from simple to complex and they went from living almost exclusively in water to living on land. And this just kind of goes with that same major trends in the, uh, in the vertebrate phyla here. So what do we actually have for amphibians today? Frogs and toads, salamanders, and then a group called Sicilians, which are kind of snake looking, but they are not scaled like what actual snakes are. And so that's why they have their own grouping. And so let's take a look at uh, some pictures. So here's a picture of a newt. Um, newt looks a lot like a salamander and, and vice versa, but they do have kind of their own anatomy. Um, here is a picture of a frog. We can talk about the difference between a frog and a toad if you want, but usually uh, it has to do with the anatomy and kind of the, their mouth. So um, if we just look at a frog, usually it's somewhat pointed, and then a toad is going to kind of be a little bit more flat with, uh, with its shape, but that's not always the case. So um, we better not get into that. If you take natural science with me, we'll talk about that quite a bit. So amphibians did really, really well, and um, they needed that aquatic environment. One of the things that we'll talk about next is, and this is huge, is the rise of what's called the amniotic egg. So as we mentioned earlier, fish and amphibians laid soft-shelled eggs that needed to be either in a superhuman environment, they needed to be buried, or they needed to be laid in water. If they didn't, they would dry out, the creatures wouldn't survive. A huge, huge evolutionarily evolution adaptation was the rise of what we call an amniotic egg. And what this means is it's a self-enclosed egg not like the egg of a chicken. It was more leathery. And we started to see this in early reptiles and in dinosaurs. And there are fossil records showing that this was indeed the case. And so what that allowed is not only for hard shelled eggs, but also internal fertilization. So instead of like spawning, and by the way, we see this in, in frogs and, and, and um, you know, it's, uh, salamanders and newts, you will see like a mounting happen where the male deposits the sperm in the egg. You can also see external fertilization um, in amphibians still, 
but with reptiles you get internal fertilization. So basically, not only are is there a safe haven inside of the mother when she lays the eggs, but when the eggs are laid, they also have a safe haven with having that leathery shell around there. Um, this evolutionary process, we'll talk a lot about how this gave rise to the, the reptiles, birds, and also mammals. But um, this slideshow basically went over the start of our vertebrates with especially the different kinds of fish and the amphibians. And with the upcoming ones, we'll talk about the reptiles, birds, and mammals, and some dinosaurs.